June 9th, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern and different times in different time zones. I am Lumi Hilchi with the German Convention Bureau. And uh, this is our take two after it didn't really work out last time. So thank you very much for the ones who re to the ones who returned. Um, this is our second webinar that covers the COVID situation. We did have one in April where we were trying to figure out, oh my God, what is going on here? Um, so we, we got some uh, panelists together. We talked about um, the situation at the time. And now three months later, how do we move forward? So that's what we're trying to figure out today. We will not have perfect answers for everybody, but we have a very diverse panel of um, professionals representing both planners and suppliers from the US and in this case from Germany, um, and a very uh, a wonderful moderator. I will introduce everybody in just a minute. We will be discussing really, um, are we ready to travel? Um, are convention centers and hotels ready for us? Um, what measures are we as suppliers and also as planners putting into place in order to reassure everybody that things are safe for them? And of course, there are questions, a lot of questions, question marks around these, but um, we want to leave this open for everybody to jump in with questions. Please type in your questions in the, in the box. Um, we want to be here for each other and um, have this be a conversation that is between friends. So um, one last thing, this uh, video will be recorded and shared with everybody. And the session qualifies for CMP credits. And um, here are our panelists, I will read them. Lisa Astorga, International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostatis. Diane Kovats, International Society for Computational Biology. Diane Heffernan, CCE Global Meetings and Incentives, Inga Segelman, Frankfurt Convention Bureau, calling from Frankfurt, Nadine Barenbruch, Vienna House Andes Hotel in Berlin, Agnes Gersich, sorry Agnes, Gerschich, uh, Munich Congress Venues in Munich, and Laura McPhee, Drone Racing League. Um, Feel free to, definitely thank you everybody for keeping your microphones muted and feel free to um, also close your camera if you're camera shy. And um, without further ado, Matt, our moderator, editorial director, Connect Meetings will take over. Well, thanks so much, Lumi, and we really do appreciate everybody being here. Uh, there's certainly been no shortage of webinars in the last few months, uh, but, uh, we really do have a great panel with a lot of different perspectives. I think people find it very interesting. I know I did when we even did a run through and we'll get some great international points of view, some views from venues and from planners as well. Uh, obviously for any family members or people who have dealt with COVID-19 in terms of illness and we express our grievances and all that, uh, it's been a very challenging time on a number of fronts. Uh, so we hope we can help in our way to get people thinking forward and toward a recovery, uh, which seems to be happening slowly. And we'll hear more about what's happening on this front. Um, we're gonna start things off with Diane Hefferman, who has a unique perspective of running her own business and coming from the corporate world. Uh, Diane, why don't you kind of share uh, some of your experiences and where you think uh, you're going forward? Thank you, Matt, and thank you for having me. You know, I've been in, in this industry for most of my life with the latest venture of opening CCE Global Meetings and Incentives almost three years ago, just in time. Um, we're third party planners, so I see this from a number of different perspectives, both the corporate and some associations and different across different industries. I feel that the meeting industry is one of the most significantly impacted. You know, we've all seen 9-11, SARS, volcanoes, hurricanes, but I think COVID-19 is going to impact us long-term. Um, the most significant change for me is not so much of a change, but I've always valued my relationships with my vendors. And this has really brought home the point as to why that's so important. In the past, over the past months, I've spent almost every day um, replanning, moving about 20 different meetings across again, all, um, different venues and hotel chains. And I found that each of my vendor partners has been willing to sit down and talk to me on a one-to-one -one basis about that specific client, about that specific issue, and really have a conversation. 
and sometimes it really wasn't very comfortable. Very often it was an uncomfortable situation, but we had that conversation and we built a better relationship. Um, the road ahead is gonna be challenging, but not impossible. What I see is that we're going to have to take a look at, um, we're, we've been working on a better contract template, how we outline our statement of purpose, our meeting objectives, our force majeure, talking to our suppliers about how we're gonna move forward with the new industry guidelines um, and our duty of care. What's our responsibility? It's not just about risk management, it's about how we prepare for the health, wellness, and well-being of our, both our staff and our attendees. I tend to be an optimist, so I feel that the industry will come back stronger than before. I think people wanna socialize. Virtual will only take us so far, and I think we're all kind of zoomed out. Um, my, meeting, my company has been lucky. We've kept our staff employed and we've been working on projects that'll help us allow, uh, allow us to emerge stronger and better as individuals and as a company. Um, we've been enjoying this time a little bit, the silver lining by brushing up my, myself. I've been brushing up on my Spanish and studying for the CITP exam. Um, I've also been cooking, which shows, definitely shows. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Diane. And Diane brings up an interesting point we'll probably hear more of throughout is each event in, is going to be a case-by-case -case basis probably for a while. And I think you're going to hear that a lot, especially from why it's so important to have different perspectives. Uh, we're going to actually go now to Inga, who's going to bring us uh, the lowdown in Frankfurt, which Germany has been at the forefront of uh, how to move forward and how they've been dealing with cases. So I think it's really interesting to hear what's happening in Frankfurt now and what's planned ahead going forward. So well, thank you, Matt, and thanks for having me here. Um, so here in Frankfurt, we realized the full extent of the crisis when IMAX Frankfurt was canceled um, because Frankfurt is hosting IMAX since its first trade show in 2003. So that was a huge shock for all of us here, although we knew it was the most a reasonable decision. Um, now, three months later, we have some positive updates to share here in Frankfurt. So we are happy to see how our city slowly gets back to life. So um, half of our restaurants and about half of our hotels are already open again. And events are possible for up to 100 people. So there is one person admitted per 54 square feet. But this rule now has been removed for the restaurants. So that was a huge relief for our restaurant owners here in the city. Um, yeah, when we look into the future, we are very happy to see that the Frankfurt Book Fair actually takes place in the middle of October at Messe Frankfurt, where usually um, IMAX Frankfurt takes place too. Um, so the director of the book fair called it a special edition this year. So um, the stands will be larger and the aisles will be wider than in previous years. Um, the Messe Frankfurt is actually giving away additional space for this. And um, yeah, when it comes to stage events, they will be moved to the internet or to other locations away from the exhibition grounds. And the number of people will be limited depending on the areas occupied. So, um, and of course, there will be a very strict hygiene and a health concept. So yeah, I, I worked for the book fair as a student, so I kind of have a special uh, connection to this trade show. And I'm very excited to see how this like hybrid event um, will turn out in the end. And also we had some very good news yesterday. So the Messe Frankfurt announced that the Fashion Week um, is moving from Berlin to Frankfurt. So um, next summer, Frankfurt will be the new fashion capital of Germany. And there will be lots of events throughout the city. And yeah, that's gonna be very interesting. There will be topics about like sustainability or digitalization. So we're looking forward to it. And also we think here at the Frankfurt Convention Bureau um, that the book fair and the holding of this new kind of fashion week um, are very positive signals for our city and uh, for the mice industry in general. And hopefully, like I mentioned to Inga before, that uh, it won't be until next May that people have a chance to experience it with IMAX. Hopefully, it'll be sooner rather than later going forward. I know that means everything's going well for each other. Uh, next, uh, 
I think it's a really interesting perspective from Diane Kovas because as everyone knows, associations really rely on in-person events to go forward. And so Diane is a very smart person. Luckily she's in charge to tell us what's going on here. So how are you to kind of manage this and where do you see going forward? Oh, Matt, you're too kind to me for sure. Um, well, I'll say three months ago, we were in a state of shock and anxiety as ISCB being a small staff, medium sized scientific organization that didn't, d does not rely on journal revenue to support the operations of society. We just saw all those dollar bills going out the door. Basically, that one big in-person event that we hold every year um, is what sustains us operationally. So we had to quickly go into to crisis and shifting mode of, you know, how do we still serve our membership knowing that we cannot meet in person um, for at least the, the current time period, but how do we create um, innovations within the own, the, the way we deliver scientific content to our members to encourage membership because Membership was highly based on your attendance to, to the meeting. And I, I think we're getting there. Um, I'm very excited now that I've gotten through the depression stage and gotten over my anxiety. I'm actually in the excitement stage where this has really forced us to, to think differently and to think about how we can deliver science, science equitably across all regions and all parts of the world and how we can really bring people together. Um, I had at first thought a lot of our stakeholders would be very timid to enter into a virtual platform. Um, over the course of the past two months with our planning, I've actually seen that more requests, can I have more time? Can we be more innovative? Can we be more flexible with our schedule? And I didn't necessarily expect that because they have been so great of just following my direction. But now I have a little bit of those who are peeling off to be their own mavericks and renegades throughout the process, which is great because it shows that they're really trying to adapt to the new world. Um, ISCB does a lot of also sub-regional events that we have been looking at that are supposed to be coming up here in the second half of the year. And we've been very strategic in how do we still deliver science in those areas where they're not recovering as quickly from the pandemic as other areas? And how can we get back face-to-face -face as quickly as possible. I, I know all of the meeting planners on this call will give me a hell yeah when I say, please, Lord, let us get back to face because planning these virtual events are 10 times harder than just showing up on site. But I've been very encouraged um, with the response from our community and being flexible and patient and accepting with us. I do think it's gonna give us a different way to deliver science in the future, even when we are in person, to continue to deliver an equitable, reasonable price, a platform for those who can't show up in person and how to create those that connectivity worldwide. So that's certainly encouraging. And I, I hope that we still find ways where um, outside of not being able to gather that we can continue to create collaborative um, networking opportunities. So I'm slowly coming out of the just pure anxiety stage and looking more optimistic towards the future. And I think that as we work together as true partners and rebounding and, and be communicative with one another, that um, we're going to come out of this a lot stronger than we were before and a lot more innovative because I think this has finally pushed science to the 21st century, which is so exciting for me. Quick uh, follow up, and we had a question about which platform you're using for the virtual conference. We're using a platform called My Conference Now that is being developed by Perform Media LLC out of Alexandria, Virginia. They were our content capture supplier vendor for our uh, in-person conferences, and I knew going into the big shift that I didn't have a lot of time to look at the thousands of platforms that are out there. So I went to them first. So they're actually in the process of building things um, uniquely for scientific conferences, but there's also a lot of other great platforms out there that have proven to do really well. Um, Events EQ has a great platform. Freeman has a great platform. And it's really about strategically what you want to have as part of your virtual conference and all those components that are working in the back end and your comfort level of um, do you want to reinvent the wheel or do you want to have something that's more off the shelf that you can just kind of customize a little bit. 
Great, thank you so much. I told you she's a very smart person, uh, everybody. She's one of our former 40 under 40s at Connect Association as well. Uh, special shout out to that. Uh, and we're gonna go to Lisa here. Lisa has a really interesting uh, position where she's been trying to plan an event internationally uh, in Milan and also is looking ahead to domestic next year. So she's kind of seeing it from all ends. So why don't you tell us what you've seen? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, so our circumstance is not so much different uh, from Diane's with a few exceptions. I think as Matt mentioned, we were scheduled for Milan, obviously the epicenter of what was going on there in Europe uh, for this July. So in March, we decided to uh, cancel the meeting and uh, look at the evil P word, which we won't mention today because we get penalized for saying that P word, the pivot. Um, you know, we had to first, because the time frame to do this was so quick, that we had to quickly take a step back, uh, look at our strategy, our goals and objectives, and say, what do we want to accomplish in the short term? And then in terms of the long term, which is only a year out, because our meeting is in Philadelphia, how would that be impacted? Um, I think what's missing from a lot of conversations is what this does internally to an organization, and also what it does to your team and your staff. I mean, we're asking them to essentially, in some cases, completely change their roles. So one thing we, and working in a different environment or work from home. Um, so the one thing we wanted to do first was nurture the staff to make sure that, you know, we put the right people in the right places and that moving forward, they would gain those experiences to help us the organization forward. Uh, we are doing a virtual meeting. Um, I think as Diane mentioned, it's probably been the most painful thing that we've done in a long time. Um, you know, we get very used to doing our face-to-face -face meetings. You know, we, we, we try to put innovation in there, but we're comfortable in that arena. We weren't so comfortable here. And this just was the catalyst um, to accelerate that because we were all looking for some sort of enduring material anyway. Um, in full disclosure, we're working with Freeman, who was our um, AV provider. And I think, as Diane mentioned, it wasn't a time for us to start looking at RFPs and going out and exploring different um, platforms. Um, so we are moving forward with that. Uh, we took a different approach than many organizations on the uh, monetizing the, the virtual meeting. Um, because we really looked to build strong relationships with our corporate supporters who we've been very fortunate to have. Um, and since we had never charged for our content in the past, we decided that this would be that sort of first launching of what will our audience tolerate? And I think that's a, that's a, a thing that we need to look at as well. Every group is different and what their audience will tolerate. You need to sort of find that. Uh, so we're working through that process. I certainly could let you know how that looks uh, in a couple weeks when it's over, and I take a couple weeks off after that to get through that. I think in terms of the future, um, obviously it, it, it entails a whole different set of planning processes. Um, I think the, the piece about flexibility obviously is there. One piece of this is it's not going to catch us by surprise again. Uh, you know, everybody's sort of anticipating potentially a second wave. That allows us to put some sort of preparations in place. We didn't have that going in. So that would be my best advice to someone. Already start thinking about those preparations, of those alternatives. Um, essentially, we're planning three different meetings. You know, a face-to-face -face with a hosted component, a clear virtual meeting, um, or some different type of hybrid. And I think what will happen is, you know, this will be reevaluated potentially every three months or so until we can get to where we think we can make the best decision moving forward. As planners, there's a whole lot on our plate right now. Um, we are excited about that. I do think that um, the need, the human need to network and be together will force this industry back to face to face meetings. And I am so, like Diane, so looking forward to that, yeah. Uh, well, thank you again so much for that, Lisa. Such an interesting perspective and 
I mean, everybody's got it tough, but I mean, she's really earning her keep right now, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, so I uh, wanted to, uh, we had a couple of questions, seemed a lot of excitement about the book fair. Uh, so if you want to share a little more details, because it's a large gathering. Uh, so if you want to share what, what's, uh, how many people you're expecting and maybe elaborate more on the spacing issues you were talking about. Uh, yeah, I've seen a uh, lots of questions and lots of uh, well-known names in the chat. So thank you for all your questions about the book fair. Um, so there was a question about like how many participants there will be this year. Um, what I can tell you is that last year it was around like 300,000 visitors and around um, 7,000 uh, exhibitors from around 100 countries. And this year, um, I cannot tell you an exact number yet, but what I know is that the number of people will be limited. So depending on the areas occupied, this is what we know right now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I was curious, I mean, everybody here is in the hospitality or events industry and we're counting on people to, uh, ready to uh, go to an event, either drive by or uh, fly. I mean, as the, our, which panelists are comfortable sharing how their feelings are about traveling right now and if they're waiting to, to a vaccine or what's going to be their point to decide what to do? Uh, I'll leave it kind of open up to who wants to go first before I call on somebody. Yeah, so Matt, I'll go. I'll take this one. Um, you know, in my own personal preference and my own personal comfort level, as soon as I can get on a plane where time allows, I am on that plane. I just saw that WTTC has um, like certified Jamaica. So maybe Jamaica is the bright place for me. Um, but that's my own comfort level. I'm even, my children are planned to go to Florida with, with my mother in early July. Now they have to follow the protocols on the plane or wear the face mask. We'll see how they handle that with a six and eight year old, but um, that's my mom's problem, not mine uh, and all that. So, but I also, you know, I think coming from a scientific organization, I have the ability to go ask my scientific colleagues, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about the science? Which gives me a little bit more comfort and understanding um, the virology behind it and um, all of that. But we are in the process of surveying our membership that exact question. Will you travel in 2020? Will you travel in 2021? Do you have a travel ban? What, um, what precautions and what type of communications do you want to see to make you feel more comfortable as you're possibly traveling to these meetings? And I'm happy to share it um, with Lumi in the, in the German team, um, as well as anyone who attended here after our survey results come back, just to get a benchmark. Since we do have such a great group from people in Germany, uh, and Germany has been really at the forefront in thought leadership and prevention, uh, curious, is it, anybody could illum Ill illuminate more, what is the situation with restrictions? Uh, what are hotels like? I mean, what are people gonna walk into going there? Um, should I, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Uh, Maybe uh, we can uh, go to uh, Agnes. Do you want to share a little bit what's happening? Uh, a little bit. Uh, what is what's Munich like right now? Is it open or? Oh well, um, yeah. I would say um, the situation in Munich at the moment is yeah. We are. I would say we are slowly getting back to a normal life. Um, the first step was in mid June to reopen our beer gardens, which makes us very happy. I mean, everyone probably knows how important they are for us in Bavaria. So um, yeah, we will able to join the sun and the beer gardens there, um, and yeah, to enjoy our beer there. And yeah, now the indoor spaces at the restaurants and hotels were also allowed to reopen, um, of course, with strict um, hygiene requirements. And happily, uh, cinemas, concert halls, and theaters are allowed to open in mid-June with maximum 50 people indoor. And uh, of course, well, I hope we can get back to a normal life. <laughs> I think that we all are definitely hoping for that. I mean, the question really is, are we in the new normal or are we in the new now? Uh, maybe, uh, Laura, do you have a thought of, is this the future or are we just kind of getting through what we need to get through now? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Matt. And I think that's a perfect segue into who DRL is at a core. Um, we're a professional drone racing property and we combine the innovative drone technology, custom content and visually thrilling races to create the sport of the future. And so for us, I think we really do think it is the now. Um, my team and I design and produce competitive drone races in iconic venues around the world um, as seen on premier sport networks, including NBC, ProSieben, Sky, Twitter, and so many more. And look, COVID has been a tremendous impact on the sports and events industry. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. But for us as a sport that authentically merges the digital with the real, DRL was able to highlight the esports side of our league and bring fans closer to the sport um, while giving back to the community. Uh, Matt, as you know, was speaking our new president, Rachel Jacobson, in April, we unveiled a number of programs that draw millions of viewers to DRL races. And our newest virtual, vir our newest virtual drone racing series, we partnered with FanDuel to create a Sim Racing Cup, which allowed us to premiere in the midst of COVID um, with our pilots competing on digital replicas of the historic DRL tracks, um, in our own virtual drone racing video game called the DRL Sim. And they've been able to do that safely from the comfort of their own home. And so, you know, the pilots have been donating their prize earnings to COVID relief efforts and essentially showing us what this new now looks like. Um, we actually have the races premiering on NBC Sports Network and Twitter, and there's actually one this Sunday at 1 p.m. if you want to check it out. But for us, it's really allowed us to evaluate um, how we move things forward. And for us, you'll be seeing us do more fanless events. So a majority of our races thus far have been fanless since the beginning. They're made for broadcast, but um, drone racing inherently is a contactless sport. So yes, the drones crash and collide with one another, but the pilots never actually touch the drones or make contact with each other. They're all seated in separate cockpit chairs, relieving many of the health concerns that prevent, you know, are prevalent in other sports. And for us, safety has always been a top priority. So we're following CDC, state, federal, and international guidelines to ensure that events and health and wellness standards um, are taken into place. For us, we're looking at conducting temperature checks, we're providing PP and E, we're doing additional overnight cleaning, we're adding sanitation stations, we're hosting all meals on site, we're implementing team-based social distancing protocols. We plan to continue to use technology, despite as much as all of us are tired of Zoom, um, to conduct those on-site meetings. But really, we're looking forward to being back on site with new protocols in place, delivering engaging content, and working with our vendor partners to um, soon have fans safely back in stands to create that new now. Well, thank you so much. The Drone Racing League is definitely one of the most innovative uh, sporting leagues out there, in part because uh, they are one of the newest leagues, and uh, their CEO is a Harvard graduate, and he's been an entrepreneur his whole life. So if you're looking for kind of, uh, kind of future trends there, I always like to look at the DRL for that. Uh, now, every, obviously in this industry, the front lines have really been the hotels. I mean, they, many of them were closed for a while, even those that were open were under very short staff and had limited occupancy. And now we're going to turn to Nadine, who's going to give us some firsthand experience about what's been going on there. How do you plan ahead, unsure of how many rooms you're going to fill? Well, yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, so it's been a very challenging time for all of us. Um, with Vienna, I was over 50 properties. Uh, majority of them were, we don't want to say closed. So we used this phrase of snoozing because they were just sleeping for a while. And uh, very happy that they were allowed to, to open now. Um, slowly, slowly, a um, couple of them are going to open a little bit later because we are doing some kind of renovation. Um, but at the end, it was a great um, possibility to just uh, take the chance and um, think about the new concept because we do have to do all the restructure processes and um, it's not only about the guests who's uh, coming, but also about the staff. So we need to make sure that it's safe and, um, and healthy for everyone. So what Vienna House has implemented, and I really appreciate, is actually kind of a manager of health and safety. Um, who is going to be the first point of contact for everyone, even for the staff internally to address, do you have any questions? Um, what um, are we going to follow? Which routes? 
which hygiene protocols are in place, um, but it should be also be the point of contact for every guest, considering at one stage far away from home and, and not sure about what is happening or if you feel sick, so what is the next step to do so that there's one point of person who can help you to just sort out all the questions that you may have and to make sure that you feel safe and um, in, in good hands. So um, this is what we are doing right now. Um, it's um, good to be back in the property um, from time to time. Um, and it was very, very sad to see our large Congress hotels, um, well, switch mostly um, switch off uh, the lights, no guests. Um, so we were really happy when we had the first really, really small and tiny meetings coming back, but at least there were guests and we were really happy and thrilled about them to have them back. Um, the protocols are currently working. We are training our staff to make sure that everyone is really aware of how to deal with people, keeping the distances. Um, they are all distance markers. We are having a new Buffy, uh, breakfast Buffy lineup um, to make sure that we are really making sure guiding the people around, helping them a little bit how this new setup is and the new now. I also only want to call it the new now um, because I'm pretty, pretty sure that um, we are going to be back um, to what it used to be at one stage. It will take time, um, but uh, definitely we are going back to that. And this is what I'm really thrilled to see. I mean, we all had in the beginning like kind of shock moments and not knowing or helping the guests to rebook and postpone their events. And um, of course, even um, disappointed um, individual clients um, that we had to deal with. And now we are at a stage where we're seeing, oh, there are new requests coming and they're not even very cautious. Uh, so it's just like, okay, we are having like 500 people. We want to bring them back to Germany. And this is what really makes me optimistic to look in the future and say, yeah, okay, this is the period we have to go through. But next year, we are going to be at one stage at the point where we've been now. And it will be, I'm sure that we are keeping some situation what we have just implemented right now and that's not bad um it's good th that we had to have the possibility now to maybe deal with things that, that we didn't really wanted to do before because there was not the necessity to do like taking care of this virtual hybrid events now you have to set up the innovation and you have the time to do that um and um i do see it as an addendum hopefully um, I'm not going to see that as a replacement because this is what we all said, that the networking part is a very important part of every meeting and this you can't really do in a virtual event. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sure maybe this is a possibility to just add more people to a conference by having these opportunity to just um, implement a virtual part in it. and um, that was a good position now to just say, okay, we have every partners, um, talk to them, uh, just get it uh, right, um, change the setup a little bit, think about what you can do, streamline, maybe also having different price models right now to see this is what we can offer right now. Maybe it's not what you need because of the Buffy situation, which is really strict. Um, in Berlin, it's uh, so exciting at the moment because every day you're getting more news, what is going to open, what is going to change. So in the beginning, it was only 50 people allowed. Now we are already at 150 people in the hotels. End of June, it's the first uh, time that they're allowing 300 people. So it's just like good signs. And um, the, the first trade in September, the EFA in a new format um, is going to come back. Um, very sad that we um, lost the fashion week, but Inga, congratulations that it's going to Frankfurt. Um, but yeah, so it's, um, I would say the, the signs are positive and um, I'm very much looking forward to it. And it's just like, okay, we want to we wanna meet people, we want to meet our clients. So we are also putting our strategy now in place to meet our customers again and say, hey, we are back and we are still here. So that's all exciting. Okay, quick uh, follow-up, Nina. Is the Water Club, uh, Watergate Club back open? Oh, to be very honest, um, that I don't know. Fair enough, but we can Sorry learn. for that. We'll do, we'll do a you know, I mean, that. I'm also staying more at home at the moment, so it's just yeah. like I'm... <laughs> no, I, I think I, the clubs are still a little bit limited, but um, the museums and um, the concert halls and theaters, they are coming back, so I'm sure that the clubs are also going to have kind of regulations, so if they can handle it, they should do the same. Very good. Well, let's move over to Munich, where I had one of my most memorable vacations ever. Uh, so what's going on with the Congress venues and what's, what's, what's looking ahead toward the end of this year and into 2021? Yeah, well, um, I mean, we are facing the similar challenges as the Hotel Vienna in, Mürpel, in Berlin. Well, um, yeah, so how is the situation at our venues? I mean, actually, um, each federal state has its own guidelines. So the current situation in Bavaria is that um, yeah, any kinds of uh, events are unfortunately forbidden until end of August. 
So since we have a lot of space, we are fortunate can host some examinations at the moment. And um, we are also planning to have uh, live streaming studios and a drive-in cinema with probably also um, live concerts at our grounds. So um, yeah, it's not a still moment at our grounds, happily. Um, well, so currently um, we are working together with other convention centers and as well with the government on concepts in terms of travel registration and crowd management and hygienic measure, measures to give um, recommendations how events and trade fairs could look like at our venues. So yeah, that's really a challenging time for us. I mean, we have to think about, um, just to give, you, to give you a few points, um, how can attendees uh, travel to and from the event venue safely? I mean, in this case, we um, also working together with the airport and public transportation. At the moment, we recommend an individual arrival by car, but this can't be the solution probably for the for further events. So um, we are working on this. And yeah, how does a contactless registration look like? I mean, um, that's really a lot of challenges we have. Um, we have to think about the um, event procedure and crowd management based on the governmental regulations to make sure that the attendees can keep the distance of uh, 1.5 uh, meters to each other. So actually we are planning with um, four square meters, which is approximately 43 square feet of each person. So um, just to give you all an idea, we will only be able to occupy a maximum one quarter of the halls and rooms. So just to give you an example, um, in a room where we usually can have up to 3,000 people, we now can only host a maximum of 350 people. So that's quite a big difference. And um, well, to give you some um, ideas, what we will also do is um, that we will have to keep the doors in an open position to reduce guest contact, of course with hard surfaces. Um, we will be frequent, we will have frequent cleaning and sanitizing of public areas. Of course, um, we have to place um, hand sanitizers and hand washing stations throughout the whole venue. And which is also a, f a big challenge is the F and B area. Um, this will, yeah, really look differently. I mean, there will be only a staff catering stations um, or lunch boxes or so no self service anymore. Um, so the events will really look differently. Um, I mean, we will host the first exhibition in mid-September, so I'm really, really positive and looking forward to host um, great events uh, again at, at our venues. You brought up a really uh, hot topic about F and B. I think we should elaborate more. I, and I like to get the perspective from one of our suppliers and also one of our planners on how to go about uh doing this to accomplish the goals of obviously there's the objective of feeding people safely but also there is other elements involved in terms of networking and just a social element uh how do we balance doing that what's that going to look like uh and uh i could i guess nadine i kind of turn to you with the hotels and because those mm -hmm. are going to really uh be the first ones to experience a lot of that and then happy to have uh one of the Dianes or Lisa kind of take it from there from uh, the planner point of view and what they're trying to accomplish. So if I may start, so from the restaurant side in the hotel, I mean, yes, of course, there is a distance between the tables. So we are going to leave uh, spaces empty in between. Um, our waiter are all wearing masks and gloves. Um, and a little bit heartbreaking because our industry is uh, people's business and we are used to have this um, in Vienna House we always are local host uh, which means actually we are talking to our guests we are now at the stage where we should limit the um, personal interaction with the guests as much as possible um, to just avoid these um, yeah having the, the discussion with the guests so it's more like digital menus, um, contactless check-in and check-out processes, um, just um, really do everything um, that the people feel safe. Our bar is still closed. The reason for that, it's a, a kind of on the 14th floor and there is an elevator always bringing the guests in and um, the bar was or is uh, actually quite well known in Berlin. So there must be um, still a version that we do have host to control who's going up and how many people are going into this elevator. Um, so this is what we are looking into um, in the different steps right now. But the restaurants, 
um, they are going to um, yeah, have all the hygiene me measurements in terms of um, how we are serving the cutleries, um, that we are not going to have any setup at the table. Um, we are all bringing everything individually as per the, per the order by the guests. Um, so it's more individual personalized service without talking to the guests, um, being close to them. Um, that's for the moment what we are looking at. Uh, so it, uh, maybe Diane Hefferman, would you be, uh, it's been a while since we heard from you since you started first. Uh, how would you, I mean, what are you looking at when you're planning F&B going forward uh, live? Uh, how do you balance that act? It's a really interesting question, and Agnes made a really good point because we're having to reevaluate all of the meeting space in itself. So a room that typically held 500 people will now only accommodate maybe 150. So you have to restructure everything. Um, you know, looking at cocktail receptions, you know, getting rid of the, the cocktail rounds, making sure that people have more space in the room to, to distance themselves. You know, looking at what a 72 inch round will now accommodate in a sit down dinner and going more toward seated, you know, plated dinners rather than buffets, which have always been um, more interactive and more getting people up and moving around. But, um, you know, we've been looking at both scenarios and how we're going to keep the social distancing as well as keep the, the service levels to where we want them to be. So it's, it's challenging. An uh, interesting a thought, I mean, in some regards without buffets, at least for the present, uh, is this going to help the move towards sustainability since there'll be uh, more there? Uh, somebody... Sorry, I have a face. Well, you know, I would love to hear Diane volunteer to talk, you can hear that. <laughs> so I, I think sadly, as we start to work through the new now into the next normal, and I'm going to call it the next normal, because um, there's certainly things that are going to be changing. Um, we are going to have to probably let go some of our sustainability efforts because a lot of, you know, we were getting away from uh, protective packaging on everything. And I think for the, the comfort level and the perception of comfort and uh, control for, from an attendee or even from a meeting planner, they're gonna to want to see things that are, are wrapped and packaged so that they know that once they touch it and they unwrap it, they're the only one then touching that food outside of the service, the provider who's making the food that has to go for, through very rigorous protocols on how they can even start to make food. So sadly, I think for a little bit of time, we're going to, we're, we'll, we'll revert and then we'll start to find ways on how to bring back sustainable materials. There's just, right now, there are not enough sustainable materials that will be able to handle the volume of food. And then it'll be interesting to see how planners actually adapt to, are they going to offer food service? And how we're going to have those conversations with our vendors around that food and beverage minimum um, because of that, just that, that comfort level behind the touching and the contact of, of delivering food. So I do, I do think sustainability is, is going to take a step back for a while, sadly. Yeah, I think another area too where, where this will be impacted is um, obviously we look at some of our events, our poster networking sessions, where it gives our young scientists an opportunity to network very closely one-on-one -on -one in a, you know, reception type atmosphere. You know, how do we replace that? Or how do we accommodate that so that that can still happen? But in addition to that, I think it'll be an interesting um, evaluation of how this impacts some of the compliance issues on the healthcare society, because some of what we need to do may directly contradict the compliance measures that are put in place against some, you know, uh, pharma guidelines. So there's a lot more uh, conversation that'll take place than, than some of the immediate things that we're seeing. And I think we'll, we'll start to have that long term. Absolutely. Well, thank well, you. If I, sorry, Matt, if I can just step in uh, quickly here, because um, I mean, this was one of the biggest challenges at Vienna House as well, um, how we are going to handle this um, since uh, there was in the beginning that there's no buffer allowed. Um, and now they went to you can do kind of elements on the buffet which are pre-portioned or pre-packed. 
Um, and for us, it was a big challenge to say, okay, it needs to look good and um, the people still want to eat it. But um, we had a very huge a sustainable approach last year rolling out throughout Vienna House. And that was one of our biggest challenges. We said, no, we don't want to take this step back. We want to keep and continue with that. So it was very difficult to find really the good packaging and the right partner to support us with that. The other side was, it's of course a cost factor which came on top um, that we do have to absorb somehow because it's um, also not a point that you can adjust uh, across um, this um, these costs any further. So. Um, it's, um, it's a, challenge, a challenging situation at the moment for all of us, but I think there are ways. Um, you don't really need necessarily to take this step back. It's the easy way in the beginning, but I'm sure give it another month when the, the hotels or the suppliers and all the partners are getting ready for that, um, they will definitely have a solution, which is also keeping the sustainability aspect a little bit more in mind. Patience. Yeah, I just want to, sorry, Matt, I just want to make a, uh, a quick reference. I hope we don't go back to bottled waters everywhere. I'd really like to see um, a lot of associations and planners still um, look to ways to encourage personalized vessels um, as we move forward and venues putting in those really great water dispensers that are automatic so you're not touching any buttons. So maybe that's a way we can still move forward with at least the reduction of plastics because that you know that's a, a huge environmental sustainable um, area that we should still be focusing on in, in the events business events industry. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. I was just going to say, okay. Diane, we're looking at providing all of our staff and crew water bottles to ensure that, and then bringing in the contactless water stations to allow so that our sustainability efforts are no longer backtracked, but to be able to make sure we're moving forward. Anybody else want to chime in? I don't want to step on. I know everybody's gotten it. This is definitely a popular topic. And uh, so I want to sure everybody's heard who wants to. Uh, uh, otherwise, what I was going to say is what, what Diane pointed out. And at first, patience is a virtue. And also, one aspect to look at is like with the airports, they've done a lot of the, the uh, touchless water, which leads me to my question for Inga, like the kind of the uh, million dollar question in this Zoom room uh, is. Uh, the general perception is regional travel will come first, followed by domestic and then international. And what, how is Germany presenting itself to an international audience in uh, going forward when uh, it's not quite clear exactly what the regulations are yet? Yeah, that's really a good question, Matt. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Germany ranked second safest country in the world. And we here at the Frankfurt Convention Bureau uh, think that communicating and informing constantly um, is the best way to promote our destination to US travelers. Um, so we work together closely with our tourism marketing and on our website, you will find regular updates like what is going on in our city and if there are special offers from our hotels, venues or uh, incentive suppliers, um, because we believe that only if the um, planner is well informed about what is the situation at the hotel, um, what is the situation um, in the city, what does the airport situation look like, they will feel comfortable enough to travel again. Um, yeah, and we were happy to see when the US airline Delta resumed its connection to our airport in May. So there are flights from Atlanta to Frankfurt three times a week. Um, yeah, another thing that we do here um, as a CVB is offering virtual site inspections every Wednesday. Um, we're calling them our virtual weeklies. Um, and we actually started last Wednesday um, with pre uh, presenting our 25 hours hotel. It's a very like uh, hip hotel where every room tells a different story. And so it was very well to start with. Um, right now we're uh, offering them only in German, but if things continue to go well we can imagine to offer them in English too so that would be also an interesting point maybe um, besides of that we think that b2b events have an advantage over b2c events um, because it's easier to eliminate risk factors like person density or uncontrolled crowd movements um, and so we think that b2b events will come back faster and we here in Fran Frankfurt look um, forward to welcoming our US planners here again soon Hopefully. Uh, that was great. And we definitely hope for that. And like 
I know I've been to Munich uh, and it's really a wonderful area and um, I, I hope to go back someday. I even got to experience the day of Oktoberfest uh, uh, back in the day, uh, uh, a lot less gray hair ago. Um, but uh, so we're gonna kind of, we're hitting a, about 50 minutes in. So I think we're gonna kind of go around the horn uh, with some final comments for people. I wanna start actually with Laura on this front and uh, with her thoughts. And one question specific to you and with, as grow, how do you continue to grow a league slash business uh, in this environment? And uh, what are some strategies going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I think for us, we do have the benefit of our broadcast. And so how do we create content both on social media platforms that is creating a uniqueness and showcasing the sport? As you had indicated, we're still a young sport. So we have a lot of opportunity to innovate and change things as we continue to grow. I think for us, safety is always going to be our number one concern. And so you know, whether that's our staff and crew and protecting them from just drones and, and the way we operate uh, to introducing the sport to families and, and young um, members. I think for us, we just want to continue to follow guidelines, to be innovative, to come up with unique ways, whether that's, you know, finding a hybrid of um, not allowing audiences, but going live from broadcast or, um, you know, maybe a behind the scenes tour that we haven't featured before. So I think trying to think through any and every idea that we can to create um, that fan base while also not rushing into it. I think, you know, as an industry, we need to continue to learn from each other and grow together that as we are um, gaining insight, as things are changing, as potentially a second wave is coming, how do we, as Lisa had said, how do we take what we just learned and and not have another step back, but continue to step forward. So for us, I think it's just continuing to use um, the events and tourism industry, the other sporting agencies to be able to continue to grow together and, um, and make sure that we're, we're able to continue what we do in a safe way. Well, Lisa, she, uh, Laura, segued right to you there. So, I mean, I mean, what is, I mean, what is next? How do we make sure we do it right? Because, you don't want to be the event where another outbreak happens, I mean. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. But you know, Matt, for us, first and foremost, uh, we still look back to our uh, overarching, you know, goal and objective and our strategy, right? Which is to deliver science and education uh, around the world that ultimately for us saves lives. So that's a huge, uh, you know, objective for us. Um, how we do that, I think as planners, as the industry, we're going to have to be innovative and deal with what comes in front of us and also be prepared to do that. Uh, again, like I said, I think we have a little bit more insight into this. So um, we'll be flexible. Uh, our ultimate goal is to get that information out. And for me, hopefully to be back to the old normal uh, very soon, because I think that that's critically important, uh, not just for the industry, but for, you know, from networking, from our particular industry, science and education, it's it's extremely important. So we're, we are charging forward, and I'm very optimistic about it too. What do you think, Agnes? Oh well, um, you mean my thoughts about the last weeks? Yeah, well, as Lisa already said before, I mean the last weeks really has shown me that um, a face to face meeting is so important. So. Um, I'm really happy to see um, that all the people love to see each other in person and love to meet uh, meet each other in person. So these all ideas of virtual events, um, I think it will be an addition, but not the solution and not the future. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, Diane Kovacs, so I, are you optimistic going forward? I know it's been a lot of planning, and I'll. Uh, what's what do you what's, what are your thoughts going ahead? I thrive on optimism, Matt. So yes, I mean it's it's certainly exciting. I think it it this all has pushed us out of our comfort zone, which which is scary. But I think change is important, and I think as we move through this process, we've been at least for from an ISCB perspective, we've been able to identify our weaknesses on how we serve our members and how we can better serve our members. 
Um, I too am like Lisa, I cannot wait till we get back in person. I know um, in, in science, that opportunity to network in a hall and network at a poster or in between sessions or even sitting next to someone in sessions is really, really important. And I believe the scientific community is going to be thriving for that. Um, it'll be a challenge if we are restricted in terms of the number of people we can allow on site and how we can create uh, a hybrid online platform for those who can't be on site or who do, didn't get the ticket to be on site to still um, continue with that opportunity to network with, with one another. But um, I think it really gives us the opportunity to advance our, our own abilities as a professional and how we can deliver content around the world. And I would strongly suggest to everyone on this call, your content has value, don't undervalue it. So Diane Hefferman, uh, what are corporate events gonna look like? I guess, uh, that's <laughs> well, corporate events I think are going to, I think corporations are gonna have to take a hard look at, you know, asking their staff and their employees to attend a meeting. You know, one of the other perspectives that I'd like to take a look at is um, the incentives. We do a number of incentive travel meetings and that's opened up a whole new, you know, we can't do those virtually. Um, if you have incentive travel, you can give them another incentive, but the travel portion, it can't be virtual. So we're looking at being the, the person to our client of, how do we let people know that it's safe to travel? Making sure that we're uh, giving them information and communicating to the incentive winners that we can be safe, that we have put protocols in, in place and that well, it is safe to travel and what we're doing in order to make sure that they feel comfortable attending that incentive. The incentive is only worth um, the value if they feel comfortable going to it. So Nadine, uh I know you're ready for a full house again. Uh, when do you think uh, it's happening? And uh, what do you see going for the end of this year into next year? Well, of course, I would hope it's going to start as soon as possible, um, as of September, if you ask me. But um, yeah, I'm sure that the, the first events are going to be back um, end of this year. I'm very optimistic on that one, um, if the situation stays uh, like it is right now. Um, I'm very optimistic for the first beginning um, for um, next year. So maybe first quarter will be a little bit still cautious, um, but I'm sure that April, May is actually what I'm super optimistic, to be very honest, because this is also the feedback that we are getting from the partners. And this is also what I'm taking from the past weeks, months, um, that you're connecting with your partners on a completely different level. It was not calling them about business, but it was just like, hey, we are here to support, to find a way. Um, so that's why I totally agree with everyone, saying flexibility is key um, and sh really showing that you are a partner and not, we want to have your business. Of course you want, um, but you also want to do your business and um, making the most of it. Um, so it was just really like finding mutual solutions um, to be able to do business in future, um, because this was also one of the key points. Um, looking into who's actually still there next year. Um, is it this, the hotel side or even the partner side? Who is going to make it through the crisis? So very, um, very touchy point, I would say, um, in the last uh, couple of months. So we always, uh, when we did this virtual calls and events, it was always like, okay, Vienna House is uh, bringing our home now to your home and uh, let's see what we can do and to work together. So um, this is what I really liked. Um, being in this together, yeah, uh, many times that, um, but really, really lift it together with our partners. Um, so I like that one. Inga, any uh, final thoughts from Frankfurt? Yeah, so, well, together with the German Convention Bureau, uh, Nadine, Agnes, and I talked with many US planners in the last few weeks. Um, and some planners told us they do not worry that much about the hotel or venue situation in Frankfurt or in Germany in general, because they are sure that we will have the highest hygiene standards here. But what they and their clients um, are really more concerned about is what the airport situation will look like. Um, and so I've recently read this very interesting article in the New York York Times um, called the future of travel and it stated that the current situation would inevitably lead to a reorganization of the airport so gate space could be expanded maybe there will be no uh, crowded security lines anymore so all in all it could lead to a like 
better passenger experience from curb to gate. So maybe out of this bad situation will come something positive in the end. And that is how me and my colleagues of the Frankfurt Convention Bureau are trying to see the current situation and look positively into the future. I hope we're all right. I know at Connect, we're looking forward to going in person uh, later this year as well. Uh, I think we're all hoping that this is the new now uh, versus the new normal. Uh, I want to turn it back to Lumi, who I want to thank her again for really organizing this. I mean, what, I mean, I think I've been really impressed with every single person here. I mean, I hope you all have it's really interesting stuff. And there is no one right answer. And we had all at a crystal ball, I mean, we'd be in a, some kind of a science fiction book. So it's really interesting uh, just to hear perspectives. But thank you again, Lumi, for doing this. Thank you, everybody, very much. Um, we hope we were able to provide some answers and some vision. Um, you know, again, we don't have the perfect answers right now, but also thank you to all the chat going, we've been following, and um, thank you to the other suppliers who jumped in to provide more specific information about specific venues and cities in Germany. Thank you to the other planners who uh, shared, um, you know, their ideas on chat on the chat um, group. And so uh, this really shows us that we're all united and um, very grateful that we are together and learning from each other. And um, we will stay in touch. We will probably have another webinar at some point when, when it becomes relevant, when we have more information to share. And um, until then, um, I think for Germany, if you have any specific questions, as you see, the answers are all over the place because all the regions are doing different things. Uh, just ask me and I'm happy to connect you to the right region and the right partner who will have the local news um, day by day, basically. It's a, it's a day by day situation right now. So thank you very much, everybody. We hope to see you again soon and um, in person. And um, until then, stay safe, stay well, and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you all Bye. very much. Thank you.